Please listen carefully. Hello, universe. Welcome to the Optimist Daily Update. I'm Summers McKay. And I'm Christy Jansen, and we're part of the team behind the Optimist Daily, making solutions the news. We bring you reader-funded solutions news every day in order to change the tenor of news media, social media, and the direction of your day to help make them focus on solutions. Seven days a week, we publish positive news stories written by award-winning journalists and delivered online to your inbox and through our social channels. And also, we are sharing these solutions in a commute-worthy, walk-worthy, home office-worthy, maybe even drive back to the office-worthy podcast. Today is Tuesday, the 27th of April, 2021. So over the weekend, Christy, we had the opportunity for the Optimist Daily to go on Good Morning Arizona, which is, you know, a ABC affiliate in Arizona. And they invited us on to talk about this pending dread that a lot of people have, this anxiety and some depression around this whole return to work experience. And you and I have talked about this so much on the Optimist Daily Update you know, while there is like an excitement and an exuberance to go back to work, there's also a fear. And, you know, (laughs) we've had these, like, we we have these things that we've done. And we've also in this past year, learned, like, to really take a lot of time quietly and by ourselves. (laughs) So it's just interesting that we were invited on to have this conversation. And I was really happy to share some of the tricks and tips that at Optimus Daily, we've recommended, which include change up your routine. So do something different. We keep talking about how it's not back to pre-pandemic. It's on to something different and better. So whether it's get a new coffee mug or take a different route to work or wear your watch on a different wrist, it's do something different to change it up so you feel like you're starting something new. And then of course, as always, read the Optimist Daily before you go to work, right? Because that's how it's going to get better. So Christy, Or you guys are like a week away, right? Yes. Or the other thing is you could do, get into your office five minutes early and open, the first thing you open on your browser is the Optimist Daily. Exactly. (laughs) And just start your day with that and go, oh, that's such an interesting, refreshing take on that issue that I hadn't really thought about before. Yeah. uh, And start that kind of mindset. Exactly. Just bookmark it it and start mm -hmm. that day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. We are planning to officially have our offices open again on May 3rd, week from uh, yesterday. And I have to admit, I'm full of anxiety about it. And it's not even that I feel anxious because by then everybody who is working with us and who's, who will be working in the office will have reached that full vaccination marker. Mm-hmm. And we have a pretty it's not very dense anymore because you've left and we don't feel like it's sort of like <laughs> I've left, Kaylee's left, Amelia's left. Remote now, yeah. right? And so folks who were coming into the office last January are no longer coming into the office. Right. And that's just part of the 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 role. And I do think that there will be there'll continue to be some flexibility in terms of some of us working from home some days a week. For me, where I'm working with you and on these doing the recording, I think I may do that from my home office now since Mm -hmm. I have a great setup Mm -hmm. and I can get this done early and then get to the office a little later. But I don't know how it's going to look. And I think for me, just the change of routine again is is uh, makes me anxious. And what is it going to mean? What is it going to look like? I don't know. Everything still feels in flux. Headlines are still frightening. And I don't know. Once I get to it, I think I'll feel better. Yeah. I, I think that this, the burnout, the lassitude, which is kind of filtered down as we've come into our second April in this new reality, once we start to feel like things are a little bit more normal, it'll feel more positive. I mean, right. for example, last night, my husband and I went out to dinner for the first time in more than a year. <laughs> <laughs> because, which is crazy. Which is and crazy. How did it feel? It felt good. We're outside and, you know, I think there's 25% capacity. It was on a patio. We got to take our dog with us. I'm now eating vegan. So that was a little funny to manage that. But it was nice. And it was kind of starting to rain. But we were determined to get out. (laughs) (laughs) And it was really nice. And it felt invigorating. And the interesting thing is we ended up going to bed probably 45 minutes, close to an hour later than we've come to be going to bed. Because we did something different in the evening. Had a new thing to do. Right. Yes. Um, but I didn't wake up. I wake. I woke up feeling plenty of energy. You know, I don't feel drained from it. I felt 
energized by it. So I think once we can go back to the office and also go back to having lunches with friends or doing different kinds of things without that paranoia, it'll feel better. Yeah, for sure. Slowly, slowly. <laughs> for sure. Slowly, slowly, it will come, it will come back. And I think, you know, it's just everyone be patient and be generous with yourselves. Don't compare yourselves to anyone else who's having a different experience. Mm-hmm. And uh, just, you know, this next chapter, they, uh, as, as we wrapped up the segment on the show, they asked what word reminded us and, and reminded me of this next chapter. And of course, I picked the word optimism. But I don't say that tongue in cheek. I really actually do mean that. I think what comes next for all of us is going to be a bigger, broader, more expansive opportunity. I think as a world, we are more committed to one another and committed to community. And uh, we learned so much this past year. So much was brought to light that we didn't otherwise know. And conversations that we never used to have have begun. So I'm excited. And uh, I think, you know, Christy, do you want to do you want to take the first pass at the story that you picked? Our stories work very well together and well with our topic of conversation. Sure. But one of the things that maybe has permanently changed during the pandemic. What is it, Chrissy? Well, Perhaps, and this is just perhaps, but I don't know. It's going to be take a lot to shift this pattern in our lives. And I'll read the headline. <clears throat> Shared domestic work offered more job security for women during the pandemic. And what we're seeing is that this COVID-19 pandemic has really negatively affected women in their role in the workforce. It especially was challenging for mothers, for caregivers. The loss of childcare options and in-person schooling, even the fact that our the grandparents, if you're not living in the same home, wouldn't be there to help take care of the kids or your yeah. the other family members and friends. It's just sort of that cutting off of all of the outside engagement meant that the burden of childcare teaching just fell onto the shoulders primarily of women, because even in mixed gender couples, women have just continued to do more of the housework and the childcare. And this combined with the lack of adequate policies that include paid leave, job flexibility has forced many women to put their careers on the back burner so they could be there for their families. And this is not, and, and for many women, this is great and they like this, but for many women, this is not ideal. And it's led to economic losses that are unprecedented for women. Before the pandemic, unemployment rates for men and women for 16 and over were about equal. There was about 4.4% unemployment. But throughout the pandemic, unemployment rates for women rose to 16.1%, while the unemployment rate for men went up. It went up significantly, but only up to 13. So there's a a gap there, which is significant. And part of that was the different kinds of jobs that women are more involved with or have more like service oriented or front facing. But a big part of it was because of the burden of childcare and, yeah. with, you know, and just the options. And you experienced this. Yeah, uh, we certainly, uh, you know, along with so many parents, at the end of the day, my, you know, my husband and I worked very hard to split the days. I have an important job that means a lot to our whole family and we are all committed to it. But even splitting the days, at the end of the day, most of the work does still fall on mom. And, you know, my husband, I mean, I joke this morning, he made himself, we, you know, both hit, worked out and he made himself breakfast. And I looked at his plate before I came to meet you for this meeting and he just handed it to me and said, have a good breakfast. So I've got a pretty good participatory husband, but at the end of the day, my whole team at the Optimist Daily, you guys have all had to be so incredibly patient with the fact that COVID-19 meant mom, you got a mom first. It's, mm-hmm. you, there were no other options. Right. And and that's just how it is. But what they, there's a new study that just came out in gender work and organization that finds that in households where the fathers were able and willing to participate yeah. more actively in the child care and rearing, the mother's chances of escaping the negative employment outcomes because of the pandemic were far better. Yeah. Uh, and where fathers were responsible for almost equal between 40 to 60% of childcare duties, the women in that, in those mixed, uh, those different sex couples were far less likely to leave their jobs or reduce their work hours. And for every 20% increase in the father's share of childcare, mother's time in paid labor increased by three hours per week. 
So it's an interest. It's an interesting study. It shows that it it really does affect the ability for gender parity or g- close to that in the workforce mm-hmm. and in a world that, that does seem to make sense that there's a lot of value for having women in the workforce and a lot of women I mean I know for me my job and my work world has and my career has been very important to me even being a parent but in order to do that you can't do everything on your own you really need to have a supportive partner and a supportive community around you to help take care of your children and to grow our children and so this is just a, a snapshot and perhaps it will change. And I'm, I'm guessing that your husband is really, it's a wonderful thing for him to have been forced to, in a way, mm-hmm. be so intimately involved with the raising of his toddler daughter and infant daughter in this yeah. first few years of her life. And so he's going to have a different relationship with her than he would have otherwise if, if he didn't have, wasn't forced by the structural situation to be there. And, you know, I know many fathers who are very nurturing and it's been, it's been very much at the front of how they want to set up their lives. But a lot of the societal pressures have not supported that. Exactly. It's not, it's not like on the dads themselves. It's on the structure of society. Right. And at the end of the day, like when, like our daughter today, we, we have to take her to the doctor. She's got a sinus infection. It is what it is. So for me to tell my colleagues, guys, I got to wrap a meeting early. I've got to take my kid to the doctor. Everyone's like, oh, okay, sure. No problem. For my husband to say the very same thing to his colleagues, people aren't accustomed to that and they don't respond in the same way. Right. And there's not, you know, paternity leave isn't as widespread as maternity leave. It's not just the guys who aren't stepping up to care for the children. It's the entire structure of how parenting and how work happens that has to evolve to be more inclusive so that women can have a more, you know, productive workforce relationship as well as men can have a more productive, like it actually raises everybody's game, Mm -hmm. work and family. But I think one of the things about this story, Christy, that we have to be so careful with is that, and, and this leads to my story, which is that it's very easy to compare ourselves to others, right? And somebody mm-hmm. might be listening to this and think, oh my goodness, Summers and her husband split the days so she could still be CEO, blah, blah, blah. That's amazing. Well, it was amazing. And it was also hard as heck. And probably another word, which I won't use on the podcast, but it was incredibly tough and incredibly exhausting and not always simple or good. (laughs) There were definitely some raised voices. There was definitely some hurt feelings. There's definitely like we did the best we could. And I recently had an experience where I was listening to the Michelle Obama biography Becoming this past weekend when you and Amelia sent me to go clean my office, which I did. I put it on and I found myself feeling so oddly competitive and kind of sad because her whole life just seemed perfect and all of her struggles they worked through and everything just seemed so good and it just made me feel small (laughs) and like well I'm never gonna be like Michelle Obama and one of my friends I shared this dialogue on uh social media but one of my friends was like and then those arms (laughs) exactly and those too but uh you reminded me and Tammy, who we talked to, Tammy Stevens, who we talked to a few days ago, also reminded us um, not to compare ourselves to others. Well, our editorial team at The Optimist Daily went and found an article to give us a tactical way to avoid comparing ourselves to others. The article reads, first, choose an experience that takes your mind away from comparison rather than focused on what others are doing, like Michelle Obama's arms and perfect family and amazing career. Put that energy toward facilitating positive outcomes for yourself based on your own goals. So tactically, for me, example, getting to show up to work every day at the Optimist Daily and do a really good job and crush our numbers and find ways that we can get indexed by Google and make this world a better place with the stories that we have. That's my goal. And I love doing it. And And what this article is reminding us is to live from the inside out. Yeah. Instead, instead of looking at ourselves from the outside, which leads to that comparison, mm-hmm. live from your own heart center and from your own values and what's meaningful to you. And so this choosing an experience that takes your mind away from comparison, like look at what's around you and what you have, right? Um, right. So, right. Yeah. Well, and then the next one, if you can't get out of your own head or out, if you can't get <laughs> into your heart and out of your head, get out and move your body. 
I love this one, right? That, that high endorphin adrenaline experience of whether it's like a really quick hit 15 minute workout or just dancing around the kitchen to your favorite song, yoga, swimming, anything that takes you out of negative headspace. It's, it's that shock treatment to your body with activity to lift you. And then last but not least, we talk about this all the time, but it is practice gratitude and remember what you're grateful for. And so when I took myself through this process, I thought about how incredibly grateful I was to have the opportunity to organize my amazing office while listening to an incredibly inspiring autobiography that I could then discuss with colleagues that I admire. And so Instead of feeling competitive with her, it was like, wait a minute, I am so grateful I can learn from this person. And, you know, those are just three tactics to help shift you when you are in comparison. I think a fourth one, which isn't in this article, but is super important to remember, is that everybody presents a view of themselves to the world, but that doesn't necessarily mean what's really going on. And even like the the perfect couple that you see, you know, your your friends... or your your friends parents <laughs> they yeah. seem perfect but there's a lot of negative stuff that's going on in there yeah i i too, wrote you know what on I mean? and, social like, exactly i wrote on social life is far messier than memoirs oh, allow us to you have the beautiful right? family vacation to hawaii <laughs> but it, it doesn't show the the spilled drinks and the 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 bickering that's going on in the hotel room exactly <laughs> exactly Well, there are so many other great stories on the Optimist Daily today that are also more technical solutions. There's a new radar in Costa Rica that can track tiny space debris. A wave energy machine is part of Scotland's plan to fight climate change. A cave experiment lets volunteers reconnect with their natural circadian rhythms. I love that. Let's go hide in caves. (laughs) And an initiative empowering kids to join the conversation on climate change. What else do we have, Christy? Well, this one's really important and I think exciting. There's a new vaccine that offers a potential breakthrough in the fight against malaria, which is a worldwide killer. And that's exciting to read about that again. There's a startup that wants to use balloons to capture CO2 miles above ground and get that out of the atmosphere. Adidas is unveiling its first shoe made of mushroom leather. We've been writing about other brands using mushroom leather, and that's very positive towards reducing our dependence on animal leather. And California has made the commitment to end oil extraction in the state by 2045, another turning away from the fossil fuel economy towards the different kind of future. And that is uh, what we have today on The Optimist Daily. And thank you for listening to The Optimist Daily Update. Go check out all those articles and more at OptimistDaily.com. In the meantime, we promise to keep sharing positive, solution-based news stories with ideas on how you can participate in the changing world to help ensure it is changed for the good. We promise to cover current events with accuracy, legitimate sources, and offer you the information needed most to chart new paths for all of us. And if you have means, please consider becoming an emissary on TheOptimistDaily.com and for just $5 a month, support reader-funded, independent journalism. Be part of the solution changing consciousness and addressing our world's biggest challenges with a problem-solving mindset. Let's keep The Optimist Daily free to all who need it, supported by those who can.